Greetings! Welcome to the Sword Lab. I am Darth Anonymous, and this is a Jamma doll. And this is a Jamma doll. Some explanation is probably needed. As many sword nuts will know, YouTube is chock full of great channels that explore historical weapons and martial arts. One of them is the Metatrod. His is a very popular channel with lots of great historical information and weapons discussions. Recently, he did a video on the Zanbato, the Japanese version of the Chinese Zanma Dao. Um, <clears throat> it's a very good video, and I will link it in the description, but after watching it, I felt there are some gaps and misunderstandings that uh, I could bring to the table and perhaps clear up as far as the history of it all goes. This being my wheelhouse and all. So before we begin, let me make a little disclaimer. I am not an academic or scholar. I am merely a martial artist with a burning passion for history and the origin of the tools of the sport that I train. Most of my research was done informally and built on others' true research and scholarship. I am coming at this from a martial arts perspective. And because of this, I'm indebted to those who do the work of the real work of collecting and sharing all of this material through books and, and internet and uh, other publications. Also, I apologize in advance for my Mandarin pronunciation. It has been a long while since I've had to use it. I'd like to give a big shout out to a couple of sources that have been invaluable in making this video. Big thanks to the Great Ming Military Blog and Peter Decker of Mandarin Mansion all, for all of their help and generosity with their time and much of the research for this project. Also, I would like to thank Bed, Jun Bed Judkins of Kung Fu Tea and for his contributions to the video as well. All three of these sites are linked in the description. Please check them out. So. I train a, and study an art called Ma Shi Tongbei Chuan. Tongbei is a Ming Dynasty concept of training a well-rounded soldier. It takes much of its philosophies, methods, and exercises from Ming Dynasty sources, so I had a practical familiarity with the material. But going through and researching for this video has added a lot of clarity to things that were very unclear for me before and has formed some new perspective on things for me. I chose to focus on just a few main points that Metatron brings up. Hopefully, I can add a bit of detail to the historical perspective on the topic, um, as I find it fascinating. So, without further ado, take it away, Metatron. So the original sword is Chinese, and uh, th th one of the people who asked me to talk about um, this sword, although they asked me to talk about the Zambato, Zambato and I'll tell you in a minute what, it, what the difference is, um, they uh, gave me a link to uh, a Wikipedia article, but the Wikipedia article was indeed wrong, because the Wikipedia article talks about this sword as a uh, Japanese sword which originates from a Chinese original sword, which is the Jamma Dao. But then they say that it's a Song Dynasty or Song Chao, uh, Song Dynasty sword. Uh, no, the, so that's the first thing we need to say. Um, and I yes. found that the Jamma Dao as a sword is already mentioned in the book of the Han. So we're talking about the Han Dynasty or Han Chao. So when we find this character here, most of the time when we talk about swords we are talking about single-edged swords but in the case of Jamma Dao in China um, yes when we reach the Song Dynasty these are single-edged swords but when we talk about the original ancient version during the Han Dynasty then they were double-edged so the sword has received a an evolution during time throughout time okay the first mentions of horse cutting weapons are indeed from the Han Dynasty and they were in fact double-edged jian as opposed to single-edged dao. The term zan ma jian, however, does not refer to the same thing. It refers to a sword of exceptional quality or sharpness, something that could cut directly through an entire horse, um, leading to its other name, duan ma jian. Um, it doesn't appear to be an anti-cavalry weapon, but a highly prized status symbol that was often used to ex execute corrupt officials. 
The Song Dynasty brings us the first official description of the weapon bearing the name Zhan Ma Dao. This weapon was specifically designed as an anti-cavalry weapon, but it is true that the Zhan Ma Dao was a result of a long history of sword making in China. In the Tang and Sui dynasties, a weapon called the Mo Dao was used in much the same fashion. That sword was, again, not designed for anti-cavalry, but was used often as an executioner's sword. The Song Dynasty Zhan Ma Dao was designed specifically for anti-cavalry tactics, and it was also mass-produced for soldiers, some sources say by the tens of thousands, and had rigid requirements of production and quality. The weapon itself was supposed to have been a have a blade of three chi, just under a meter, and a handle one-third the length of the blade, capped with a ring pommel. Since this was a mass-produced item for the military, it's assumed that variation in the weapon was kept to a minute. By the Ming Dynasty, the term Zhan Ma Dao referred to quite a different weapon. The Zhan Ma Dao was described by many military catalogs as a polearm with a large blade. It is mentioned in a training manual on the Dao Dao or Yan Yu Dao. The techniques are said to be the same for each of these weapons, and they are seen as cousins in type. This outlook persists today in many traditional schools and in modern wushu. The evolution from the more conventional-looking hilt and blade ratio of the Song weapon to the long polearm of the Ming may be a combination of traits with the larger Yan Yu Dao, or Da Dao, which was also used in the Song dynasty, as well as several other weapons that combined polearm and sword. We see a preferred use of this type of weapon to be on horseback in the Ming rather than infantry, according to the manual. In the Qing dynasty, the Zhan Ma Dao takes on a totally different shape. The Manchu government issued a standardized set of sabers to the Lu Ying, or Green Standard Army. Among them was the Zhan Ma Dao. Here, it has a long, slender blade and a more Japanese-style hilt. This is the sword I believe is being compared when the Odachi and the Nodachi are mentioned. At the end of the Qing Dynasty, many of these terms for long-handled sabers started to become interchangeable, depending on who you were talking to. The long-handled saber was a very popular weapon in the Republican period, and many variations were common training weapons and sidearms during the turmoil of that period. Several units became famous for the use of the Republican Dao Dao, different from the polearm of the Ming Dynasty Dao Dao, but which was similar to the long Pu Dao, but with a more sword-length hilt. Today we essentially have two basic sword designs that are called Zhen Ma Dao, a glaive-like polearm and an odachi-like long-hilted saber. Pu Dao, Da Dao, Zhen Ma Dao, Shuang Shou Dai, Chang Dao, and several other words have been used almost interchangeably. Today the terms are no more clarified or standardized among schools or traditional arts. It can be very confusing. The most common terms for these weapons today are Pu Dao for the long polearm, Miao Dao for the odachi style saber, and Guandao for the ornate bladed glaive. Dadao is used for the more conventional sword of the Republican period, but there's still a lot of variation between schools. However, later in the video, he does say this. Eventually, both the uh, old pole arms and all very long weapons, so Nodachi, Odachi, Naginata, Nagamaki, Nagamaki is a, again an evolution of the original Jamma Dao because the uh, sort of handle and hilt, the way it was constructed, was actually more similar to a Nagamaki than it would be to a, a Nodachi in, in certain cases, particularly the ancient version. So, again, Nagamaki is a branch of, uh, from the original Jamma Dao. Uh, now here is where we're going to agree almost 100%. The only thing that I would argue here is that the Nagamaki is more of a direct translation to the Janma Dao than perhaps the Odachi. But again, I don't know much about the actual evolution of the Japanese weapon. So take that for what it's worth. Anyway, continuing. When you think of the original continental China uh, sword, then uh, it is different from an Odachi because the construction is different, for, particularly the blade, because the blade only has a curve at the end, okay? But it's quite straight. Okay, I believe what is being described here is the Qing Dynasty Lu Ying Zhan Ma Dao and not the Ming or Song weapons of the same name. This saber has its own history and it equally is fascinating. 
The Jatmada of the Qing Dynasty, Green Standard Army, was one of several standardized sabers issued to that force. The Liu Ying were a force of mostly Han Chinese that had surrendered to the Manchu, Manchus at the end, and, end of the Ming Dynasty and start of the Qing Dynasty. The interesting thing about this version of the Jianman Dao is that it seems to be descendant from a Ming Dynasty weapon called the Chang Dao, Long Saber, or Dan Dao, Single Saber. This weapon is famous for helping defend the Chinese coast from the Japanese pirates in the Ming. The weapon is also said to be taken from, at least inspired by, the Japanese Odachi and Nodachi that were sometimes employed by the Japanese of the time. In Cheng Zongyi's famous 1616 manual, Dan Dao Fa Xuan, he states, This weapon is called the single saber because two hands are needed for one sword. The techniques were taken from the Japanese. So, if we're looking at the Lu Ying Zan Ma Dao, we are most likely looking at a weapon inspired at least in part by the Japanese Nodachi slash Odachi. Ironic, since it is the opposite of the common narrative. From this perspective, I find it fascinating how, if true, the Song Dynasty sword could inspire a Japanese sword, only to have it backtrack and inspire a Ming Dynasty sword hundreds of years later. So we find that this concept of using a massive sword to cut down cavalry with your infantry is a concept that was not invented in Japan, but was invented in China, and it's much more ancient than the Muromachi period when these were most commonly used in Japan. The field of application, though, is very similar. We understand that they were both used for cutting down cavalry. So the first question should be, why using a sword for cutting down cavalry when you have already your troops using pole arms? Wouldn't it be much more effective to just use Yari or to use uh, Naginata or to use the Chinese versions of spears? Um, well, that is something that has to do with, we should go into battlefield and warfare and everything. But one thing that I think makes sense, first of all, we do know that these original ancient Jamma Dao were quite robust. They were quite thick, they were quite strong. Um, sturdy, should I say, not really thick, sturdy. So um, they were used for cutting the um, legs of the horses and they were issued to the men in the front lines of infantry units which were expecting, expected to face cavalry. So um, did it work? First of all, let's unpack what exactly the tactic is that we're talking about. The tactic in question involves luring an attack or charge by a cavalry or mounted force, slowing or stopping that charge with infantry armed with pole arms, caltraps on the ground, and various other methods. While the enemy cavalry is bogged down in each other and the line of infantry that it is engaged, the troops with the Jan Man Dao would countercharge into the fray, crouch low, and hack away at the horse's legs and necks in an effort to dismount the riders. So. Rather than being in the front lines and meeting the initial cavalry charge, Jan Ma Dao were counter-strike troops. In the Song Dynasty, the military was very focused on anti-cavalry methods and weapons due to their conflicts with the northern tribes of the steppe, like Mongols and others. It seems that the Jan Ma Dao units would be commanded in separate units, being directed to places in the battle where they could be employed. It's detailed in the Songxi history of the Song Dynasty. Among the infantry, we must select strong and able-bodied troops, arm all of them with Jan Man Dao, and select a separate commander to lead them like the Tang Dynasty Li Xie's Mo Dao method. If we face the charge of the Iron Sparrowhawk, they either harass our formation or trample our infantry. Then we can advance with Jan Man Dao, which is a surprise method to ensure victory. This method was also detailed in a training regimen for these troops. Two poles would be set on the ground about two meters apart. Troops would train hitting these posts from a crouch with Jan Man Dao, Mei Jian Dao, an eyebrow point saber similar to a Naginata or other pole arms. This was to simulate the height of the targets on the legs and necks of the horses. The specialist, this specialist training is most likely one of the things that gave Jan Man Dao its fame. In the Ming Dynasty, that tactic was used and recorded by the famous general Qi Ji Wang. Here, though, the emphasis is not on the weapon doing the cutting of the actual horses, but the use of the blocking methods used to slow down the enemy cavalry. This shield band must rely on the Lang Xian, wolf brush, as his equipment are all short weapons and cannot resist enemy horses. Use the Lang Xian to stop the enemy horses, then use the shield from below, Lang Xian, and hack the horse's legs. The important weapons mentioned here are the shield and the Lang Xian, or the wolf brush. 
The wolf brush is a long bamboo pole with many branches sticking out of the shaft near the end. Then at the end of each of these branches are little blades. The weapon was cumbersome but provided a large cover area to block spearmen or hold up cavalry um, in this particular tactic. The shield would protect the soldiers from overhead whose duty it was to come in and attack the legs of the horses under that cover. The weapons used for that job seem to vary, but it is recommended in the Ji Shao Xin Shu that the wolf brush and shield be supported by tridents, dadao, and other bladed weapons. It is conceivable that the tactic continued into the Qing, but I was unable to find any sources relating to its use. However, we can assume that the Qing Jama Dao, being much more like the Chang Dao or Dan Dao, was used in a similar method to that weapon. Mm. The Song's Jama Dao was built and mass produced to arm special troops trained specifically for this tactic. But the Qing Jama Dao's predecessor, the Dan Dao, seems to be particularly concerned with spear techniques. This is because on the field of battle in the Ming, the spear was the preferred weapon for Chinese infantry. In the Ming Dynasty manual, Dan Dao, Fa Xuan. The long Odachi type sword is pitted against the spear. The same is true of the Dao Dao, a similar weapon to the Ming Zhan Mao Dao. The techniques in that manual are in response to spear attacks as well. I would assume that the Luning Zhan Mao Dao was used in a similar manner. So, did it work? Yes, to a point. It was never a standalone tactic, and it was a gambit that required nerves of steel and a high level of skill, not to mention special training. It probably should be seen more as an ambush tactic and not a core component of warfare. But the technique does appear to be used as early as the Tang Dynasty and was continued to be used through the Ming Dynasty at least. So, why would you do this? Pitting infantry against cavalry is not usually a military leader's first idea. Cavalry and mounted forces have an extreme advantage over the foot soldier. So the question is a very good one. It has different answers depending on the time period though. The Song Dynasty had lost most of its horse lands to the enemies to the north. This put them in the position of having many troops but not enough mounts. In response, Song Dynasty technology sped forward, producing not only Zhan Ma Dao, but many pole arms and other anti-cavalry weapons and tactics. It also saw the first recorded recipe and application for gunpowder. But all of these advancements were not enough to prevent their eventual fall to the Mongols and the institution of the Yuan Dynasty. In the Ming Dynasty, Qi Ji Huang had a different approach. He held the belief that one should not passively defend against cavalry, and rather one should bring the fight to them. Taking out mounts and riders and severely damaging one's mounted force can sway the tide of battle very, very quickly. Ming forces also operated in the Mandarin Duck Formation, with long weapons, shields, and swords operating in units that, can organ that could be organized into larger forces. Long-handled sabers like the Zhen Man Dao and the Dan Dao would be deployed in the back or center of these formations ready to capitalize on opportunities provided by the Lan Qian and the shield bearers. While I have yet to find any combat-related information on the use of the Lu Ying Zhen Man Dao, I would think it's safe to assume that its role would be similar to that of the Dan Dao of the Ming. Probably deployed against spears and long weapons, its inclusion also probably had to do with the fact that the force was made up primarily of Han Chinese from the Ming. So, there we are. A little history on the big-ass sword. I had intended this to be a simple response video, but as you can see, the topic is a sprawling one, and it just pulled me in. And down the rabbit hole I went. I hope, I f I hope you found this video informative and entertaining. I had fun and learned quite a bit making it. I am sure that I have glossed over something, oversimplified, misunderstood some things in the course of this video, but I'm sure we'll return to these topics at a later date. I tried to keep the tangents to a minimum, but there are quite a few of them, just naturally. If there's something specific you would like to see a Sword Lab video on, please comment and let us know. If you're interested in learning more about the Chinese weaponry and military tactics, please check out these sites. The Great Ming Military Blog is a wonderful resource for historically sourced information on weapons and tactics. Mandarin Mansion also has some great articles on these weapons and also sells antique swords from China and other parts of Asia. There are some truly beautiful examples of Chinese weapons on that site. Also, check out Kung Fu Tea, which has a great many scholarly articles on Chinese martial arts, the study of martial art itself, pop culture, how it all relates. It's another great resource for academic and scholarly material on these arts. I plan to do a dedicated video on the Chang Dao. 
uh, as there is lots of this weapon in our system. And it is a weapon that deserves to be looked at by itself. Remember to check out Metatron's original video, linked in the description. I look forward to his next video on Chinese weaponry, as I look forward to more of these Sword Lab videos. We have a very diverse group of people here at TPLA, and I cannot wait to see what they have to share as well. So, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more videos and tutorials. Please like, share, and subscribe. Have a great day, and happy sabering. Thank <laughs> you.